Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Memorial United Methodist Church and to our digital Good Friday service. We are so glad that you have chosen to spend these moments with us as we remember the events of that very first Good Friday, as we remember Christ's passion and Christ's suffering on our behalf. As we move through the service tonight, we will move through a number of musical pieces and scripture readings and prayers. There will be a time of reflection as well. And in uh, it all, we invite you to take a moment to sit at the cross of Christ and to let these moments and these readings speak to your heart of Christ's suffering and of Christ's death for the world. Good evening, everyone. It is time for our call to worship. You're invited to participate. When you see the words on the screen, please say them aloud at home. For us, he was despised, hated, unrecognizable, and ridiculed. For us, he was wounded that we may be whole and healed. For us, he followed like a gentle lamb, to be slaughtered in silence. For us, he poured out himself to fill those who thirst. For Christ, we mourn. He came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. When he reached the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not come into the time of trial. Then he withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. 
In this anguish he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became great drops of blood falling on the ground. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, greetings rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword away into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father? and he will at once send me more than a 12 legions of angels. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. 
But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes were assembled. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the guards, warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council were looking for testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but they found none. For many gave false testimony against him, and their testimony did not agree. Some stood up and gave false testimony against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands. In three days, I will build another not made with hands. But even on this point, their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of the power 
and coming with clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, Why do we still need witnesses? You have heard this blasphemy. What is your decision? All of them condemned him as deserving death. Some began to spit on him, to blindfold him, and to strike him, saying to him, Prophesy! The guards also took him over and beat him. And share with you all my great love for the world's greatest soccer team, Liverpool Football Club. I have shared with you many times that for around the last 40 years they have been my team. I have cheered them on in the best of times and in the hardest of those times too. Now there are some standout memories for me in those 40 years. May 10th, 1986, Liverpool defeats local rivals Everton in the FA Cup final. Craig Johnson scores once, Ian Rush scores twice, and seven-year-old me is jumping for joy as my team lift the trophy. May 25th, 2005, Liverpool play AC Milan in the Champions League final to determine who is the best team in Europe that season. My team go three to nothing down in the first half and then they come out and score three goals themselves in the second half. The game goes to penalty kicks. My team wins and 27 year old me is jumping for joy as his team lifts a trophy. June 1st, 2019. It's the Champions League final again and my team are playing another English team, Tottenham Hotspur. 
We win that game two goals to nothing. And 40-year-old me is jumping for joy as my team lifts the trophy. June 2020. It's been a strange old year for all of the reasons that you and I can remember. COVID turned that soccer season upside down. Nevertheless, Liverpool are crowned Premier League champions for the first time in 30 years and 41-year-old me is jumping for joy as my team lifts that trophy. And then March 5th, 2023. Liverpool play Manchester United, our bitter rivals in a Premier League fixture, and they win seven goals to nothing. And 44-year-old me is jumping for joy as my team beats our most bitter rivals. I'm also texting my friends that day who support Manchester United just to see if they're okay. Now these are just a few of the standout fixtures and results that I could talk to you at length about. Remembering details like who scored the goals, who the MVP was for each game. But what I can't remember over these 40 years and what I would be unable to talk to you about are the days when my team lost. Those days are the ones that I'm happy to have forgotten. I'm happy to move on quickly from them and never reference them again. I love to remember and talk about the wins and I love to forget about the losses. Which is why sometimes I find Good Friday to be a strange remembrance. Now, of course, the death of Christ is of much more significance than the result of any game of soccer could ever be. But still, at face value, the events of that very first Good Friday seem more like something I would rather forget and not relive. Because, again, at face value, they appear to represent the moment of ultimate defeat for Jesus Christ. The powers that be had gotten their way. They had managed to create charges against Jesus. They had had him arrested. He was brought before Pontius Pilate, put through a sham trial, and then they managed to turn the crowds against him, convincing them to cry when prompted, crucify him, crucify him. In the way we understand the world, didn't seem like there was any victory for Jesus that day. Yes, when we look on the events of that first Good Friday, they can certainly be read in a way that makes this day a day of defeat that might be better being forgotten altogether. But then I recall the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth. He was writing to them because they had let small issues and petty squabbles come between them and create a wedge of division. And in his first letter to the church in Corinth, Paul calls them out for this. And he tells them to get over themselves, lest the gospel be impacted and the cross of Christ lose its power. For the message of the cross, he says, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. To those who have rejected faith, or to those who have not heard of Jesus Christ in their lifetimes and the good news of the gospel, finding the source of our life in a moment that seems to be an utter defeat must seem like complete foolishness. But to us who have placed our faith in Jesus, to us who have experienced the restoring and transforming work of God in our lives, the cross of Jesus Christ is the very centre of all that we believe. In these events that we call to mind in this service on Good Friday, we are not just remembering that 
authorities in the world have power and that miscarriages of justice can take place. No, on Good Friday, we remember the faithfulness of God at work in and through Jesus, who submitted himself and became obedient to death on a cross. We remember that our Lord, Jesus Christ, looked sin and death in the eye and took their power and might on, not by seekingly, seeking to violently overcome their power, but by submitting to it and absorbing it, knowing that the great power of God would be even greater than the power of sin and death. And we remember that the love of God for the world is such that he really did give his son, so that whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Yes, to those who have not yet understood the fullest meaning of Good Friday, the message of the cross must appear to be foolish nonsense. But to us who are being saved, the events that we remember tonight are the very power of God at work. Because we know that there is no glorious resurrection to be celebrated and shared in if there is not first a moment of death. As we gather here tonight, we remember the events of that day. We do watch on with the benefit of hindsight but we are also careful not to skip over this moment. We are careful to remind ourselves that Christ faced all of this so that sin and death might lose its power and might be defeated once and for all, and so that we too might know the power of God to set us free from the power of sin and death as we receive the gift of new life. Friends, on Good Friday, we don't skip over this as something that should readily be forgotten. We remember the suffering of Christ and the love of God in which he did suffer so that we might know newness of life and the power of resurrection so that we might know the very fullness of God's great love for the world. So on this Good Friday, as we consider all that Christ has suffered, as we consider that Christ drew the breath for a last time here on earth, may we do so with solemnness, but may we also do so in the knowledge that the message of the cross, whilst it's foolishness to those who are perishing, to us who are being saved, it is the very power of God. May we remain this night remembering Christ's death and all that it will win for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now, at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. Now, a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do them according to their custom. Then he answered them, do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas to them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. 
Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the King of the Jews? They shouted back, Crucify him! Pilate asked them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified.
Then the soldiers led him into the courtyard of the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole cohort. They clothed him in a purple cloak, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on him. They began saluting him. Hail, King of the Jews! As they led him away, they seized a man, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming from the country, and they laid the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A great number of people followed him, and among them were women who were beating their breasts and wailing for him. But Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. It was nine o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. The inscription of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests, along with the scribes, were also mocking him among themselves, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Let the Messiah, the King of Israel, come down from the cross now, so that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also taunted him.
From noon on, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabatani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders heard it. They said, This man is calling for Elijah. At once one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried out again in a loud voice and breathed his last breath. At that moment the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs were, all, were open, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out of the tombs, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. Now, when the centurion and those with him, who had been keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly, this man was God's son. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day.
And that brings our service to a close tonight, friends. We part with this benediction. Go in peace. And may Jesus Christ, who for our sake became obedient to death, even death on a cross, keep and strengthen you this night and forevermore.